Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. There are these two big biographies I'm seeing everywhere at bookstores these days. One is Walter Isaacson's book on Elon Musk, just titled Elon Musk. And the other is Michael Lewis's book on Sam Bankman-Fried called Going Infinite. Now, the two subjects have a lot in common. They are big personalities who talked their way into certain positions in the tech world. But both Isaacson and Lewis have a lot in common, too. They've both written widely acclaimed books tackling big topics, and they get really close with their subjects. And lately, they've both been criticized for maybe getting too cozy with their subjects, going maybe, you know, a little easy. And Pierre's David Folkenflik sat down with the two of them a few weeks ago, back when Sam Bankman-Fried's trial first began, and asked them, how close is too close? This message comes from NPR sponsor, Philo. Break free from cable and switch to Philo. Get 70-plus channels live and on demand, plus an unlimited DVR, all for $25 a month. Enjoy shows like Yellowstone and The Walking Dead. No contract and no commitments. Just all your favorite channels, movies, and shows in one spot. Try the seven-day free trial at philo.tv. Use promo code NPR to get 50% off your first month. Walter Isaacson, your book is on Elon Musk, the force behind PayPal, SpaceX, Tesla, and now X, what we all used to call Twitter. How did you convince Musk to give you so much access for this book? It was a bit of a surprise because I talked to him by phone and I said, I don't want to do a book based on five or 10 or 15 interviews. I don't want to do a conventional book like that. I want to be by your side for two years in every meeting that I want to be in. Nothing excluded. And he went, oh, okay. And then I said, but here's the other part of the deal. I don't want you to have any control over it, and I'm not going to let you read it before it's published. And he went, oh, okay. And I was kind of stunned. And then a few minutes later, somebody said, wow, you're doing Musk. I said, how do you know? He said, well, he just tweeted out, Walter's writing my biography. And so... That's how I got on the roller coaster somewhat unexpectedly. And did he ever did he ever want a little bit of a sneak peek? Nope. Never asked him for all I know he hadn't read the book yet. Michael Lewis, same to you. You met FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried when he seemed like the golden boy of cryptocurrency. Now of course he's on trial, facing charges of massive fraud. At the opening of this project, how did you convince him to let you into his life to such a vast degree? It didn't take anything. I mean, I I was introduced to him by a third party who wanted me to get to know him so I could evaluate him for a business deal. So I I didn't even know who he was when I met him. And I spent a couple of hours with him. At the end of it, the the sort of stuff that was coming out of his mouth was so interesting to me that I just said, I don't know what I'm going to do or where you're going to go or how this is going to end, but can I just watch? He, he 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 never asked me what I was up to. He kind of left me alone. And it's odd, you know, it's odd that people do this, that Elon Musk and Sam Bankman fried do this. But I think in some ways their characters rhyme a bit. You know, it's funny listening to the two of you. It strikes me that you each in this case have focused on people who are shorn of emotional receptors, right, of what we used to call emotional IQ. And yet you guys are overloaded with it, right? You guys in, so, in some ways are both able to absorb. Do you think that's absorb. true, Walter? Do you think that's true? I absolutely do think it's true. Both you and I came out of the tradition here in New Orleans where there were preachers and there were storytellers, and we took the fork in the road saying we're going to be a storyteller. And it's partly because we like observing roguish and wild and interesting individuals. So you have this sense of ability to empathize through these emotional intelligence. You also have the desire to tell a story and, you know, drawn to the roguish and fascinating figure, right? So Walter Isaacson, you know, Musk had been this force behind PayPal and then Tesla and SpaceX and he bought Twitter. And and even so, here's a guy who's destroyed much of the utility and the financial value of Twitter. And he's also revealed himself on that platform to hold or at least promote and embrace some truly hateful stuff. So to what degree in this storyteller's mode did you feel you also had to try to hold on to a sense of any critical distance? Totally. I mean, I, especially when it came to Twitter, which, uh, you know, at times I, it, my head would snap. I'd be appalled at the things he'd be reposting. And so I had to keep my head around very contradictory things, which is the awesome ability to, say, connect solar roofs to power walls and the engineering, while also holding into the fact that his lack of emotional receptors and his 
sort of dark streak that comes from uh, the demon mode, as Grimes calls it, from childhood, allows him to promote conspiracy theories when he takes over Twitter. Are we living in a moment where it's harder to write a book about an antihero without providing the condemnation from the outset? I don't know that it's harder to write about an anti-hero. I think it is harder this day and age to write about somebody who's complex, who is bringing us into the era of sustainable energy and electric vehicles, and also somebody who has this quality that comes out badly on Twitter. So in this day and age, we have snap judgments. People are heroes of villains. And when you have a character... You know, Shakespeare teaches us that is, you know, a character that's molded out of faults. Uh, Those are the complex characters. This day and age uh, doesn't, it's harder to write about them because people want you to be outraged one side or the other. With hindsight, do either of you ever feel like you were kind of swept into those vortex of these larger than life figures? There are ever moments where you kind of set aside what you would think if it were somebody you hadn't hung around with so much? Can I quickly answer that? Because I was going to, that came up earlier and I had this thought that I've never had so little trouble keeping a feeling of distance from a character because the character kept a feeling of distance from me. That I've never had anybody feel so little for me. So I didn't have any trouble feeling so little for him. It's funny, when reading the book, I felt that you were really fond of him and amused by him in the same way. I regarded him right from the beginning as walking social satire and loved his company. Still love his company. I wish I could be in his jail cell with him for a night. Because he entertained you. He's he's just, what's going on around him and his view of the world is interesting. Kara Swisher, who of course is one of the most prominent journalists covering Silicon Valley, has sort of led a pack of critics of your book, Walter, in saying, you know, basically saying, it seems to me, you aren't explicit enough about calling out what Musk has done as wrong at key points. It's such is there BS? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to defend Walter because he shouldn't have to defend himself. <laughs> I'm happy no, I'm sorry. Let me just go because I've read podcast. the book. I've read the book. And the critics themselves are often relying on what Walter has supplied to attack the book and to attack the character. Like they wouldn't know what they know without Walter's book. All they're supplying is moral outrage. Who wants that? That's not the writer's purpose here. And it's not a tool for enlightening anybody. Walter, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I do think that I try to tell a story, and I love the people who say, okay, you should have come down harder and made judgments. But the judgments are there in the stories. And I guess my goal is to tell the story as straight as I could and as honestly as I could and let the reader have some control over the reader's own moral judgments. Mm -hmm. Before we go, I just wanted to say, obviously, you guys have talked not only since your books were published, but during the process of doing your books and for years before that. Are there questions that each of you have for one another about these books, about these projects? Um, I always have questions for Walter. The one that pops to mind, and it's the one that my parents ask of Walter all the time when I'm home. How does he do everything he does? Walter has, like, six lives. He runs institutions. He's had this incredible career just apart from writing. And he has become, you know, the world's leading biographer. How does that happen? And I've never been able to figure out... Oh, Michael, Michael, Michael. No, what I want to do, do, I would like to actually watch you write. Because I can't figure out when you do it. Look, one of the things is I love to write. I'm from New Orleans. I like telling stories. So this is a joy to be able to write about unbelievably fascinating people for good and for bad. And one of the life hacks I do is I write at night and we don't have a TV set down here. And I tell you, if you don't watch TV, you got a lot more time to do things that you find exciting. Well, uh, I want to thank both of you, uh, Walter Isaacson. Thank you so much for uh, joining us from New Orleans and uh, talking about your book about Elon Musk. Hey, thank you, David. And Michael Lewis, thank you for taking the time to join with us today talking about your book about Sam Bankman Free. Totally fun. Thanks for having me. Did you know you are physically adapting to all your swiping, scrolling, and tapping? 
we're changing our bodies and what they're able to do through our habits. NPR's Body Electric, a special interactive series investigating how to fix the relationship between our tech and our health. Listen in the TED Radio Hour feed wherever you get your podcasts. Support for NPR and the following message come from Airbnb. Being an Airbnb host could be as simple as starting with a spare room or your whole place when you're away. Find out how much your place is worth at airbnb.com slash host. Support for NPR and the following message come from Rosetta Stone, the perfect app to achieve your language learning goals no matter how busy your schedule gets. It's designed to maximize study time with immersive 10-minute lessons and audio practice for your commute. Plus, tailor your learning plan for specific objectives like travel. This holiday season, get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off and unlimited access to 25 language courses. Learn more at rosettastone.com NPR.